sign in in the front end to to ask the people. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, today it's our pleasure to have Mike with us. Mike with us. Mike is a research assistant professor and ethic. Um, his work is concerned with improving how science is used in decision making. These activities span from understanding user and stakeholder needs to synthesize um, interdisciplinary scientific information to developing and testing decision and support tools. Um, his more uh, recent work has focused on testing data visualization conventions in environmental science applications and improving how models are used in environmental decision making. Um, before working at ASIC, um, he was um, on the faculty at um, Dartmouth College. He received his PhD in engineering from Yale University. Um, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm getting over a cold, so if I voice flags down uh, halfway through, uh, feel free to let me know if in the back if you can't hear me, because it's probably not going to last as long as it normally does. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today uh, are a few projects that uh, have been based around the idea that as One of these. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I hit the wrong button. So uh, it's based around the fact that um, as scientists, when we're creating scientific graphics, um, a lot of times what we're thinking about are the journal articles or the presentations that we're producing for. But Frequently, as people are getting their information online and as social media has proliferated, proliferated um, things that we produce for scientific consumption, uh, such as this um, temperature anomaly plot here, which is in the National Climate Assessment, end up in all sorts of places that have non-scientific audiences. And it, in this work, it has uh, led to the broader question of, are those audiences going to understand uh, these visuals that we're producing in the same way that we would hope uh, their original audiences do? And uh, the reason that that hypothesis uh, came up uh, is there are a variety of studies that look at how experts and non-experts understand graphical information. Uh, so this is a plot, just for example, that comes from one, uh, from climatic change from a few years ago. And what this study did is it asked a few, so these are educated non-experts. So these aren't even the general public, right? So these are people who have significant decision-making power, power. They might be communication experts. They might be academics who are not an expert in climate and compared how well those folks did with climate science. And even for these fairly well-educated, scientifically literate people, there is still a significant gap in uh, how well people were able to extract uh, content or the knowledge of the visuals that they were looking at, um, how well they were able to just interpret sort of the graphic language that they were looking at. Uh, and so this sort of thing really uh, gets at the question of, well, when the general public is looking at images that we produce that are just taken and put on websites and are used in other ways, uh, what sort of things are they taking away from it? Are they misinterpreting the messages? Uh, are we confusing them more than helping? And so where I'd want to start in giving some background to why we might think there might be a difference is that when we think about uh, different styles of communication that different audiences uh, tend to like or tend to gravitate towards, uh, what we know is that scientists and the general public often want very different things when they're looking at information. And this ends up translating into visual communication as well. So for researchers, 
how we like to see things very much uh, mimic what we expect to see when we're reading a journal article, right? We want to see some sort of background, we want some supporting details and graphs, and we eventually want to see results and conclusions. We basically want to be given the opportunity to look at something, to figure out the patterns for ourselves, to see if they match what we are seeing in text and what's in the broader conclusions. The public is uh, actually the complete opposite way around. Um, in many respects, uh, someone who's reading a sort of scientific uh, visual, who doesn't have a lot of background in it, is going to want maybe like one degree of interpretation or one degree of freedom in how they're going to interpret it. So they don't feel that they're being completely told how to interpret, but they're not given too much wiggle room to roam around and try to find something. Uh, and then if they're still interested, there's, for some people, uh, the desire to look more into supporting details. And so it's what I'll show later on is this has interesting implications for how uh, we design uh, scientific images. And so, as I said, although there are different styles of communication, what we know from uh, cognitive and perceptual science is that there are common ways of interpreting images. And so this is just a simple conceptual model that you can keep in mind as I'm going through and showing the uh, work that I'm going to show. The way you can think about it is that when someone looks at an image, uh, what you're ultimately drawing is the, where their attention's going, like their visual attention. And the two things that influence that are what's called top-down processing. So this is the expectations of what they, the expectations that the person has going into looking at an image. So what are they expecting to do with it? What do they think you want them to do with it? And also the prior knowledge that they have that they're um, using to interpret that image. Uh, that could be anything from scientific literacy, visual literacy, any sort of scientific background this person may or may not have. Um, and that's, in, uh, that's intersecting with the actual properties of the image itself, which I'll show an example in a second of what that means. And so as uh, scientists, this is probably the lever that we have the most control over, and I'll show uh, how this can be done later. And there's a variety of science that shows how, can this, how this can be done effectively. Um, but once you have someone's attention, you have to remember that they have to go through a psychological process of extracting that visual information, and then that, again, is going to interact with their expectations and prior knowledge to uh, lead to some sort of interpretation. And so I add this extra step here because I think this will be more relevant for future work that isn't shown here that deals with things that are of a more non-visual nature. So this is text and any other contextual information that we give with a visual image. And so when I talk about uh, properties of an image and sort of like very basic things about what that means and sort of basic things that we've known over time that are important. There are obviously more complicated examples. These are just easy ones. So I'd say for 70, 80 years at least, there have been something called gestalt laws, which are essentially ways that we know that people associate patterns, visual patterns, and what, which ones are more effective than other ones. So this is just a simple example of that. Um, color is easier to distinguish from shape. Right? So if you were looking at this really quickly, if I only showed you this, it would be harder to pick out that this is different than if you were, they were different colors. Right? That's something super basic. Uh, so this comes into play that if you have scatter plots, right, and you don't have too many dimensions to show, you're going to choose different colors, not different shapes. Right? Um, another big one that comes up a lot uh, is this idea that uh, well, first, let me define. So a visual variable is some sort of uh, thing that you manipulate visually with an image. So it could be color, it could be shape, it could be orientation, texture, those sort of things. Um, ideally, that should match uh, the number of dimensions of, of the data. So it should accurately express or be expressive of the data that you have. And so an example here is, um, let's say you're plotting something on a bar chart, uh, if the differences in color in these bars aren't meaningful at all, 
then you shouldn't put them there. Because oftentimes that leads people to spend time trying to figure out why these are different colors. It can often lead people to misinterpret what the graph says. Um, and another very simple example that I think will resonate with this audience a lot uh, is that uh, when we're thinking about color maps or color scales, um, changes in hue, so that's like going from red to yellow to orange green, uh, those are more salient to people than changes in value, which is when you add white to something. Uh, the other dimension in color is called intensity or saturation. So that's when you make something more or less gray, right? so more pastel or more saturated. So the example here is that um, if there's no natural um, threshold or like difference, so if there's no anomaly that you're plotting, um, you wouldn't pick this color scale at all. Because what would happen if you did that? Uh, everyone would focus on this right here, this color change. And if that's completely meaningless on your map, then you're causing people to look at things that they don't need to. And for this audience, I think the visualiz visualization science literature, I think, is for the past 30 years. I think someone publishes an article every three or four years talking about rainbow color maps and how ineffective those are, which people still use. It's an example of uh, how, I'd say, fairly robust results from the visualization science work uh, have a long way to go to making it into practical use within a lot of scientific settings. Um, and so what I'm going to get at now is, so those are very specific examples uh, and simple ones at that. What has happened over the past, I'd say, 20 years as the science, visualization science literature has matured and as the sort of practitioner uh, literature has become more robust and those two have cross-pollinated, um, there have been a variety of efforts, efforts to synthesize those bodies of evidence to provide more practical guidance um, in totality instead of these sort of one-off things of like, well, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. And that's fairly new. It's maybe three years old. And so uh, there hasn't been a lot of work testing uh, whether those guidelines are useful at all for scientists who aren't uh, visualization experts. Because I think that's where that stuff ultimately becomes very useful is if uh, you know, you're a remote sensing specialist or an atmospheric modeler, you can look at this and say, OK, I know that there's this thing that I really shouldn't do because it's going to confuse half of the readers. Okay. Um, and so this is what these two projects I'm going to show are starting to get at, is really starting to test whether you can use these guidelines to look at an image that someone else has produced and identify what are the top pieces that you can really uh, change easily and you know cause like a 15, 20% increase in how well people are understanding an image that you're so the first uh, project I'm going to talk about that uses this um, diagnostic guidance uh, is a project that uh, we finished last year with NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, um, looking at their temperature and precipitation outlooks, which are products that have been around uh, in their current form, I believe, since the mid-90s, but in practice much, much longer. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar with what those are, uh, here are two examples of uh, long lead outlooks out to the three months. Um, and so what these typically are, so for temperature, this is temperature, and precipitation. Uh, so these are probabilistic forecasts. Uh, they don't give the actual quantity of temperature uh, or precipitation. So it's looking at the um, probability of being above or below the climatic normal. And that normal part is, is uh, designated near normal, um, which is represented by a grayscale here. Um, being below or above is represented by these scales here. Um, an interesting feature of these uh, are these white swaths of space here that are labeled EC. And that stands for equal chances. And what that means is that the model is essentially no better than a coin flip for telling you what's going to happen. Um, so there's like. Probabilistically, this is complicated information, I think, even for most scientists. Um, and it adds an additional layer, I think, uh, interest 
scientific interest in terms of how you try to communicate this effectively in a visual way. And so what we did uh, with this it was a, a four-part process. And what we started with, so as I mentioned, within the past three years have been, uh, sorry, do you have a question? Or are you just gonna take, okay. If anyone does have a question or if anything's confusing, please ask. Um, uh, it, start with the visualization diagnosis guidelines that I mentioned. So these are new, more comprehensive ways of trying to allow someone who isn't uh, an expert necessarily in cognitive science or visualization to say, you know, here are obvious things I shouldn't be doing. Um, we use those to form hypotheses about what problems uh, both experts and the general public might have with these images. Um, we use those as a starting point uh, to then refine these hypotheses through a process of uh, small focus groups and small scale surveys. Uh, so the people who participated in these, uh, some of them were uh, federal employees who are very, very uh, familiar with these outlooks, have used them for years in operations or some other, uh, or in some other way, um, as well as end users that were in water, energy, agriculture, or emergency management sectors. So we tried to reach out to a fairly large swath of people. Um, the number of people in this phase was, I think, roughly around 140 people. So we tried to get a pretty wide gauge of uh, what, whether intuitively the um, problems that people might foresee with these images, whether or not they, in a first sense, uh, intersected with what we predicted uh, would be there. And so once we went through these two steps, we refined the hypotheses down. Uh, and actually what we did find is that um, they did overlap quite a bit uh, in a surprising way. Uh, we use those um, hypothesized problems to redes redesign these images for uh, three test images. Test images, and then uh, we then test how tested how well end users and <coughs> the general public understood uh, them through a randomized control versus treatment survey setup. And I just want to quickly, so you know what I mean by. Uh, diagnostic guideline. So it's just, just a quick example uh, of the one we used. What it does is it breaks down uh, problem stages that could occur when one's interpreting an image. So this, this is encoding here. These are problems that happen that occur uh, as a designer. So you're picking something that's just not appropriate. Um, these break down into different problem types. So these are things like you're choosing a visual variable that's just wrong or it's <coughs> ambiguous. Or let's say for the map you're producing, it's overly granular, just as an example. Right? Um, the other part of this, uh, so there's encoding problems. The decoding problems are things that, you know, even if you kind of make a lot of these choices right, uh, something might go wrong with the reader. It could be that they just don't have the right prior knowledge, or there, there are other factors involved that cause problems. And so this could be things like, there is too much stuff on the map. You're just trying to put too many things on. So they might interpret it correctly, but it might take them three times as long to figure it out, okay, just as an example. So we went through this process, as I said before, we used these diagnostic guidelines to look at the outlook maps that I showed and came up with a set of hypotheses. We then cross-checked these with about 140 experts and end users and converged on a set of proposed problems. Um, and I'll show what these mean in a second, but these are the four major ones. Uh, one, that there was a big problem with the color white and that it was quite ambiguous as what it meant. Um, another was understanding what near normal meant in many ways. Uh, Another was just general uh, being clear about what elements meant what and not trying to cram too many things into too many spaces. And another one which has been pointed out in many other studies, uh, sort of end user studies of the outlooks is that often people still misinterpret these maps as being the intensity of something versus the probability. Uh, so the big one here uh, when it white space or white color mapping outside the US 
how that's ambiguous is that uh, this here, which is equal chances, is uh, a white color map, and so is Canada, which in this case also means no data. So this is kind of a class example of what I mean by a visual variable, which is white color mapping, having an ambiguous scope in the sense that it has two meanings. And as I'll show later, this is actually a lot of people confuse it, surprisingly. Um, understanding of white space, uh, this ends up being a little more complicated. Um, I think what we've hit on is it has to do a lot with how the legends are designed, and especially for this one, whether people are interpreting this as a single linear scale as opposed to three different categories that have gradations within them, okay? And so you remember the, uh, earlier on I showed the slide about the value versus uh, intent or hue talking about um, thresholds and changing colors. So white space here, if you're sort of an average user, this sort of design implies that this is a, a threshold cutoff value between three continuous, or a continuous scale, instead of being three separate. And I'll show how we tried to deal with that in the revision. Um, so with dash lines, clarity, and clutter, um, historically the outlooks have had uh, these climatology ISO lines underneath the color map. Um, in the initial work that we looked at, a lot of people either didn't notice them or just really didn't know what they were, uh, which is a problem if you think people are going to use them. Um, as well as you know, small things like having text that really is intermingling with you know, the Caribbean islands and being difficult to, to read. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, uh, issues with the legend being clear as to what the scale actually is. So here are the redesigned images that we looked at. So this is the, an original actual outlook. These are hypothetical forecasts that we used. Um, this one, which is, uh, we did is we reduced the, uh, number of categories um, by quite a few, especially the um, normal one. Uh, you can't see it, but we relabeled these with qualitative labels so that people, that it would emphasize that these are probabilistic categories. So for example, um, this is labeled likely above normal, which those sort of probabilistic labels aren't on the original images at all. Um, this one uh, keeps a lot of the properties of the original image, uh, but it simplifies the near normal um, color mapping. And also, uh, all of these get rid of a lot of the ISO lines, shift some of the text. And then this one uh, takes some of the combined features of the other two and creates uh, a much different legend style that tries to emphasize that these are actually three different categories of things. Um, and also explicitly labels that white means so the sample sizes, these are the sample sizes that we looked at for the um, different images. Uh, the reason that these are quite a bit different is that uh, experts, it's actually quite difficult to get them to do this, um, even if you provide them an Amazon gift card or whatever. This was, you have no idea how long it took to get that number of people. Um, the public is actually much easier. You can use any sort of publicly available um, survey database and that's done in like a day. So. Uh, one thing that I think is great that comes out of this is you'll see that uh, the results largely mimic one another. So if one wants to do this with an image, you can probably use the general public as a proxy, and that takes a day and six months. Um, one of the things that we also looked at, we asked people um, background questions just about how the outlooks were created, and this just shows you a distribution of how End users, ex or end users and experts from the general public, how they differed. Um, so in general, uh, this isn't probably isn't surprising, the general public number of correct answers is, uh, of course, much higher. So these are asking, like, uh, how many years is in a climatology? How are the different categories put together? That sort of thing. So, and this was actually the one that had the biggest, uh, biggest difference in correct rate, which was, how many years, or what does a climatology mean? So experts obviously understood this in a much better way than the general public. So, on to the results. Um, 
So what these show, so uh, looking at white color mapping in Canada, so did people understand that that meant that nothing was mapped there? So for experts in the original image, only about 80% of like people who should probably know better understood that that's what that meant. So that gives you a sense that even if you're not looking at the general public, it's really important to think about these things. Um, the uh, two images that we, other images that we tested with this, so these are ones that just made it clear they didn't remove Canada completely, which is why uh, we were only asked for two of the images. Uh, for the general public, this made a huge difference about clarifying what uh, Canada actually meant. Okay. Um, for white color mapping in the US, it's less dramatic of a result, but what you do see for the general public is that um, you see a large increase in understanding in this map, and this is partially because, you, one, you're removing Canada, so that's less confusing, and also what white means being equal chances is explicitly labeled uh, in a legend. And so that's also, I think, an important lesson out of this is that we can't expect people to search around to try to figure out what something means to make it easy for them. Um, for what gray shading and near normal means, uh, again, you see a much more dramatic uh, improvement for the general public, people understanding what this means. Surprisingly, for end users and experts, there wasn't um, a really high understanding of what that meant. Mostly we think is that adding in uh, a gray color scale for near normal is a fairly new thing for the outlook. So people obviously get more used to something, they get better at understanding something. So even if you're fairly attuned to this sort of work, if it's not familiar to you, you can easily misinterpret what it means. Um, what this is showing, uh, so we ask questions about just what a visual variable meant to someone. So like what does gray mean? Uh, we also ask more task specific questions. So like what what's the outlook in the state? Uh, and that's what this, this uh, graph is showing here. Um, what this is showing, uh, so this one that does not do so well, is that, uh, that is this image here. Um, we chose this state uh, specifically so that people would have to use the contour lines as well as using the color blocking. And so, as you'll notice here, we use fewer color categories, so it co covers more space. And so, even for experts and people who should be used to reading these sort of maps, these sort of maps, there's an automatic heuristic to just focus in on color right away and not look at any other uh, underlying detail. So that's what you're seeing is that people would ultimately ignore what these contours meant because they were in the same color band. So it's something to think about in terms of a trade-off, in terms of simplicity and how much precision you want someone to get out of a graphic as to whether that matters or not. Um, for warm shading and above normal, normal and cool shading and below normal, we see similar sort of trends. Uh, the same uh, graph here ends up with the same problem. Surprisingly, for the modifications for above and below normal, there was a slight decrease in the modifications. We're not entirely sure why that happened. Um, for experts, I think that could have been expected. There's a fairly high level of understanding already. And so if you change something, people have to get used to it. We're not quite sure why this was mimicked for the general public. So it's a bit of a mystery right now. Um, and so overall, this is the difference between uh, the, sort of the general high profile recommendations is uh, something that looks a bit like this, where it's uh, less cluttered and there's no ambiguity in the different visual variables. Um, in the legend, it's a lot clearer what the different scale mean, scales mean, and everything is labeled uh, correctly. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears with the, a little bit of time I have left um, and show you. Yeah, sure. Multiple choice. Yeah. Um, and so that's mostly a matter of expediency. I mean, obviously, like letting people have open ended questions is 
better, but um, it's a fairly common uh, methodological choice to use. And um, a lot of times what uh, I think a key piece that came out as well um, is things that people also got commonly wrong, for example, uh, which was a big influence in choosing this design, is that uh, these blocks were interpreted as precise probabilities as opposed to probability ranges. So what they actually mean is that you know, if you're here, you're actually between, say, 40 and 50. You're not 50%. Um, and so that's kind of what's nice about that multiple choice format is you can get an easy sense of if people are getting things wrong, how they're getting them wrong. So good. Thanks. That's a good question. Okay, and so the other project I'm going to go through really quickly is we went through a, a similar but less involved uh, project looking at the U.S. Global Change Research Program indicators, which came out about four years ago, I think. This is a set of 13 to 14 global change indicators that uh, I guess you can think of that the scientific body or the, of the federal government sees as being important for measuring global change. So there is an entire process of collecting these and thinking about which are important. Um, so we had the question of because this was, you know, the people that involved in this process were scientists, almost all of them. They were, they were not really general public folks, even though this is on a website that the general public looks at a lot. So there is, again, a big question of, you know, are these, uh, are these visuals that are mostly being influenced by how we as scientists like to think about what we like to see, is that really the best thing to show? Um, and so what we did is we uh, put together a broad online survey of the 14 indicators. We, these were questions, again, just asking uh, if people are understanding the key messages behind the images themselves. Um, we then took a few of the poorly performing indicators and just, you know, use the, the same uh, diagnostic guidance to redesign them, right? Two fairly simple things, and then retested them to see if they matched. Um, and this is a quick overview of the, both the indicators and how well they did. So these are the name of the indicators here. This is the overall score from zero to 100. That's sort of an average uh, one is like 100%. You did well. Um, and these are the messages, these are the questions in the survey that really capture the key message, just to give you a sense of like, if you zero in on those, uh, you know, is it, does it roughly correlate with all the other questions you could ask about it? So some of these were not, uh, that did well, they weren't surprising. Um, the top one, uh, which measured Vibrio infections over time, that, that's this bar graph here. You know, it's something that you probably learned how to read when you were 10. And so you would hope that most people would be able to do that. And that's, that's what we found. Um, and then ones that were maybe a little less uh, uh, obvious that people would do so well. So this is a graph that shows anomalies for a frost-free season over time. The concept of an anomaly is not something that I think the general public is necessarily familiar with. But uh, I think the design choices that were made here probably made that a lot easier for people to understand. So even just simple things like choosing different colors for being fewer or more days of a frost-free season. Another one that was surprising, so this is a map of ocean chlorophyll uh, around uh, North America. So this is a really complicated map if you think about it. So you have uh, you have this, obviously, geospatial map, and then you have this link to different time trends over time. Um, all of them aren't going in the same direction. And so this was a bit of a surprise that uh, people were able to do fairly well on this. And I think the design, I think, uh, helped that quite a bit, because I could easily see with the wrong design choices this going completely off the rails in terms of understanding it. Um, ones that were a bit in the middle, uh, these are anomaly charts, so surface temperature and um, surface uh, land and ocean surface temperature. 
uh, top one is for the US, the bottom one is for the globe. Um, these, I think, more had to do with, especially for this one, the pattern, I think, is a bit more complicated for, say, the non-scientifically in inclined. Um, um, and then the ones that were not surprising at all, but they confuse people. Um, so this is the annual greenhouse gas index. So it's a chart, it's a stacked bar chart, it has two axes. Both axes are, you know, things that are not familiar to the average person at all. One's a physical unit, one's an index. So there's like a lot going on. Um, this is uh, heating and cooling degree days, which is a very abstract measure. I, I sometimes have to remind myself which one is which and which, what they mean. Um, and they're both kind of stacked on top of one another in a way that trends are a bit difficult to see. So these, these did really quite well. Uh, and so what we did is we took a few of these and used the same uh, diagnostic guidance to try to just do some simple tweaks based on what the key message is. So like the people who designed them, what's the one thing that they wanted someone to take away from this image, okay? And so for this one, what it was was that obviously the greenhouse, inde greenhouse gas index overall is going up over time. That's all we want people to know. There's nothing about the composition of gases, there's nothing about radiative forcing, nothing. Um, and so this is just, it, uh, what we ended up doing with this is looking at what happens when you remove an axis of radiative forcing, which is not what we're ultimately interested in people understanding. Um, only showing one bar, right, because we're not interested in the composition of gases, just the overall effect. Um, and so if you do that, so this is the, the baseline. Um, if you remove an axis, you end up with something that's uh, statistically significant. Um, if you do both, um, I think the change is around 15 or 20 percent change in how well people understand just like the simple message that you're trying to get across. You go from this uh, to this. It's still, I think it's a complicated concept and there you know, are questions around for if you're communicating with the general public, is something like a greenhouse gas index the best thing to use? But that's, you know, a separate question. Um, for heating and cooling degree days, uh, this for the diagnosis literature emphasizes something called uh, super, com super composition overload, which is a fancy way of saying you're putting too much stuff on a graph, which is what's going on here. And so one of the things we did was we just separated the graphs. Uh, we looked at changing the title to describe the trend. And so this is there's something called a lack of emphasis in the visualization literature. And this is thinking about what do the legends and text and other things that you're using to either draw attention or provide context to your image, whether or not that's doing what it's supposed to. Um, and then we also looked at adding trend lines to the top. Um, so what we found is that trend lines didn't do a whole lot. Adding two graphs did a, a lot. People could actually see what's going on in a much easier way. Uh, the title ended up actually doing less well. And if I remember correctly, it's because the title that we chose used words that were not, they were sort of, if you think about the chain of thought that has to go through understanding what's going on with, a co with the indicator and what that means for energy use, the title uh, only described what was on the image itself and not what it meant for energy use, which was the key message. And so I think the take home lesson there is that if you're going to go through and add a title that tells someone what the image is saying, you actually have to make it really close, not to just describing the image, but what it is that you want them to actually know. Even though as a scientist that feels like too much, you shouldn't do that. That's um, and the final one we looked at, even though this wasn't in the, uh, the indicator uh, list that I showed earlier, just to bring it back around to the original image that I started with. Um, this is the regional temperature change we did, uh, mapped from the National Climate Assessment. Uh, and this just seemed like a particular, particularly interesting image to look at because the, the key message was actually really, really simple. It was just that across the U.S. temperature is going up across a lot of different regions, but in different amounts. That's it. There's nothing about 
needing to know that needing to know that you know this part of California is warming less than like Southern California, or necessarily needing to know about cycles of temperature change in the southeast. So this is kind of a classic, exa classic example of scientists saying, well, there's all this great stuff and everyone needs to know about it, but you know, I just want you to know this simple thing first. And so uh, the variety of designs that we went through was uh, removing the time series, just looking at an average across a region and just using a color, uh, and then doing bulk, which just looks like that, okay? And so as you can see, there's a very large difference in how well people understood uh, this and this. And again, the, when you look at the report, you know, there are bullets underneath that say, this is what we want people to know. The bullet just says, temperature has gone up over the US, but at different rates over the East. Okay. So that's exactly what this says, but no more. And just to give you a sense of, you know, these were easy things that we can all do, and hopefully now that you've seen this talk, identify and solve. Um, you know, this is minimum of 15% change up to 40% change in how well, you know, the average person who's maybe seeing your image on a blog or on Twitter will actually understand what it is that you're doing. And so, I want to leave you with a few things. Uh, one is that just to really remember that researchers and non-experts, they are going to process images in different ways, and they're looking for different things. So we just need to really keep that in mind. And if, you want, if people like lists, here's a list. Um, one, again, know your audience's goals. Uh, designed to inform and not to explore. Right? Exploratory data analysis is very different from just uh, more popular visuals. Um, graphics should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that this idea of iterative design can be really key to success. And even if this is just showing it to one of your relatives at Thanksgiving or, or one of your friends who's not a scientist, you can actually get a lot out of that. And in terms of iterative uh, design, I mean, that's exactly what that means. So you want to put a little time into doing something that's good enough, but before you spend a ton of time finishing it, make sure you really get a sense of, like, are there simple steps you can take before you really finish it? Um, so future research along this, uh, there are a variety of other high-profile scientific graphics that we're looking at applying the same process to, just to make sure that these results are robust. Um, they're going to be looking at how will they apply to user-controlled graphics. Um, increasingly with the federal government, uh, there's a desire to have user-controlled data portals and interfaces, and of course, those need the same care and attention to make sure that people can use them as these static images. And also, um, looking at uh, science-based like, graphic effects tools, and can we really take these sort of results and really distill them down in a way so that it's easy for um, you know, the average scientist to use and employ. Uh, some quick acknowledgments. Uh, this was funded by uh, NOAA CPP and NOAA CTO uh, grants, PIC. Um, there are a variety of collaborators, two are which are in this room, Amanda in the front row and Melissa Kenny in the back. Uh, and any questions with the time we have left. I don't need it. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, online audience. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Back here. Very interesting talk and thank you very much for presenting it in a very clear articulate manner. Is there a cultural bias? I mean, when you were questioning the going through the questions, I'm sure you, you didn't, you took up the population from around here, correct? Would there be a cultural bias if you went to say the Far East or Africa or using a different population? That's a good question. And I think it would depend on the graphic. I mean, there are whole fields of study around uh, visual metaphors, how they figure in how people interpret things. Um, that would be, I think it would depend on, especially for our product sponsors, whether or not they have international audiences, uh, or whether you, yeah, 
I think that would be a great question to get into. I mean, there, there are plenty of studies around the kind of cultural significance, for example, of uh, red and blue and hot and cold and how well embedded that is across different cultures. I'm sure there are a variety of other ones that are uh, really ripe for these sort of questions. In looking at the CPC graphics, the red and blue works great, but for a lot of us, the red and green has the problem of red-green color blindness. And I'm wondering if there has been any thought to moving toward hues that provide greater separation between the red and the green, because it'd be easy enough to just pay attention to those factors in choosing what hues of red and green to use. I know the answer to that. Um, I probably have to ask the folks that are in the, in the pipeline of the graphic design of the outlooks themselves. But I know there are federal regulations in this in principle should affect how these images are designed. I don't remember the exact uh, regulation number, but and there are things. There are you know color scales off the shelf that people can use that have been extensively tested to be readable by folks who are have color blindness. What did you say was your um, guideline reference for? Just making figures. Oh, the uh, the diagnostic guideline that we use. Yeah. Uh, the first author, his name is Das Gupta. It's D A S G U P T A. Um, I can give you the reference later. It's on one of the slides, I think, too. With that, let's conclude and thank the speaker again.